Our last, but certainly not least, presenter is Alexandra Curtis Boyer. She is a Rye associate who took the Foundations course, previously called Rye One, the Foundations course back in 2000, and then traveled extensively exploring and learning more about Rye's educaring approach. Alex directs prenatal education programs for at-risk women in the community for the Child Abuse Council of Tampa, Florida, where she lives. She's also the founder and chairperson of Hillsborough County Breastfeeding Task Force. Please welcome Alex Boyer. Hi. Everybody had coffee and cookies, right? So I can expect to see your eyes open for, what, 30 minutes maybe? All right, we're gonna start with a game. So I'm gonna divide the audience into half. This is gonna be team one over here, and this is team two, okay? And what you're gonna be playing against each other for is you're going to guess the top five things that parents say they lose. All right? So think about it for a minute. And then when you're ready, when you're ready, <laughs> hold on, hold on. When you're ready, go ahead and shout out the answers. And the winning side gets a brand new car. And because you're all caregivers, you're gonna know how to share, right? <laughs> okay, good. All right, so go ahead and think about it for a second. And um, side number one, go ahead and shout out top five things. Time, patience, sleep, what was that? Your mind, one more. Your body, okay, nice. Side number two, control, baby sock, what else? Glasses, a pacifier, number five, personal time, excellent. All right, well I did a survey at work and here are the answers and we'll see how you match up, okay? So, number one, <laughs> keys. Mind, sleep, there was a tie, yep, there was a tie with socks and shoes, time, and then the, the uh, fifth one was a combination of privacy, self-centeredness, and important papers. So how did you guys do? Who act, what side actually got more? It was one, I think it was, good, good job, side number one. Excellent. So my name is Alex Curtis Boyer. I'm a Rye associate, and I've taught um, parent-infant classes based on Magda Gerber's educaring approach for the last 10 years. Um, on a little side note, it's um, not in my script here, but I did want to say that I heard about the Rye approach in um, 99. I was on a family vacation, and my sister, who happened to go to Rye classes in Los Angeles after the vacation, sent me Magda Gerber's book, Your Self-Confident Baby. And I um, read that book, and it really changed everything that I knew about parenting. So I'd like to thank Jamie, my sister back there, for doing that and for coming here today. <laughs> So I do run a program, a prenatal education program for the Healthy Start program in Tampa, Florida. I'm a certified lactation counselor, and I also started a program about two or three years ago that provides free at-home um, consults for women, low-income um, low and at-risk women with breastfeeding problems with their newborns, because I feel it's very, very important. My presentation to you today is called Learning to Let Go how play prepares us for life. And I want to explore with you our role as parents and caregivers in supporting infants and toddlers in distress. By authentically supporting the child in distress with the goal of building their coping skills to help them experience the larger losses that are invariably a part of our experience growing up. I started thinking more about loss when one of my daughters got married almost two years ago. 
I started thinking even more about it when my youngest turned 13. And I thought and experienced more loss with the illness and passing of my father last year. Parenting and caregiving is as much about transitions, letting go, and backing away as it is about bonding and attaching. It's a series of small losses that prepare you for some of the bigger ones, like your children growing up, moving out, and starting, parents of the, starting um, families of their own, or the loss of a parent. Where does our journey begin in learning how to cope with loss? in learning to let go. We can look at this question in a lot of different ways, but let's start with parents and caregivers for a moment as they react to very young children's attempts at autonomy and independence. Daniel Stern in The Interpersonal World of the Infant writes about which behaviors are key in the development of infants and toddlers with autonomy and independence. Erickson and Freud claim that it was the bowel control function at 24 months. Spitz claims that it's the toddler at 15 months that learns to say no. But Stern says there's much earlier behaviors. For example, during the three to six month period, the infant is a remarkably active participant with their eyes or with their visual system. They can control the direction of their gaze, the level and amount of social interaction that they want with their gaze. They can turn their eyes away from you. They can shut them. They can stare past you and they can become glassy-eyed. So as parents and caregivers, this means that even the youngest infant in moving from independence to self-competence gives us an opportunity to react to their distancing from us towards independence and interdependence. And they start this very early. So it wasn't with your child's first steps or the first day of kindergarten that you started learning about the feelings of loss that can come from parenting, for example. The process of healthy coping with transitions and loss begins in the even smaller nuances found in the infant's interactions with the world, or what we also call play, that can either prepare or undermine each human's ability to cope with loss. I think that our capacity for coping with loss as an adult is influenced by our interactions as infants, especially during play Infants and toddlers can learn these skills in a supportive environment. So what kind of losses are we talking about? I guess we hope that if we give our children a happy childhood, they won't have to think about loss too much. But with infants and toddlers, it can be the loss of a toy, the parent leaving the child at childcare, or even just leaving the room. It can be balance, like falling while trying to pull up, and how do we accompany the child in this loss? What are the skills that you want them to gain that will transfer into other situations that they'll come across as adults? Somewhere along the line, in play, we learn to modulate or adjust our grief. Is this an inner process or a social, cultural process? What's most helpful for a child learning to cope with loss? Imagine yourself as an adult in a common situation of loss. Let's say you have been tending a plant and it dies. What about if it was a fish, a goldfish, or a dog, or a friend? If anyone has ever said to you, don't worry, you'll find another blank, you know that your feeling of loss and what's socially acceptable is not always the same. And it's not always helpful to be reminded of that when you're in the mourning process. I want to give you some specific examples from photographs that I have from my work with parents and infants, parent-infant classes based on Magda Gerber's educaring approach. This is a picture of Sophia at play. And this is Sophia 
over on the left, and you can see she's got a little bottle in her hand. It's one of those Target prescription bottles that we have them in our class, so she's got that. When infants become more interested in objects, they'll choose one, and then they're tempted by another, and they have to choose which one to give up. So this was so interesting to watch because Sophia literally changed her mind probably every seven seconds. So in the first one, she sees a rattle, reaches for the rattle, but then she has to drop, then she pulls back, has to hold on to the red one, but then she's tempted by the rattle again. Did she make the right decision? Should she go back to it? So again, she drops the red bottle, reaches for the rattle. Now she has the rattle and sees the red bottle. Wait, do I want the rattle or the red bottle? Drops the rattle, reaches for the red bottle. Again, then picks up the rattle. Look, oh wait, the red bottle. I love that. Drops it, picks up the rattle, and then the final one, wait, what about the red bottle? So look at her process. She's absolutely focused in this. She's not stressed out, but she's very, very intent. And goes on, again, rattle, red bottle, drops it again, the rattle. And then in this last one, it's, um, it's just a slide so I couldn't show you, but she actually throws the rattle behind her and reaches for the bottle. So she's really made up her mind. And <laughs> The interesting thing is, so you can see that Sophia's going through this whole process of I want it, I don't want it, I want it, I don't want it, and then she has to let something go or lose it in order to gain the other toy. So this is an experience for her in loss, but look at the child who's, by the way, not moving on his own yet, so his mommy wants to put him in tummy time with the pacifier, and watch, you know, we've been talking about learning through play and through struggle. And what's his experience of all of this? And he's just watching her, but he can't move. He can't roll over because he doesn't know how. He can't mouth an object because he's got the pacifier in his mouth. It's a whole different experience for him. Babies at Focus Play are often interrupted by caregivers when we want to change their diapers or go somewhere or just draw their attention to something that we think is interesting or educational. As adults and children, interruptions are common ways in which we lose focus. There are a lot of experiences as adults that we don't like to have interrupted. Eating, making love, reading a book, talking to a good friend, or making a phone call. How do you respond when you're interrupted? You'll probably say, well, it depends on what I was doing. But what about coming back to task? Were you able to restart the activity with the same joy or full attention? Would you remember what you were doing? Have you ever asked, what were we just talking about? Or now, where were we? Each interruption is the potential end or loss of focus, loss of attention, loss of a process, and loss of an emotion. So losing your focus and then regaining it is a complicated task, and it calls on certain skills. For example, you have to be emotionally available, you have to remember, you have to be interested in the task, so interruptions and your recovery from them are a skill that we take for granted, but young children should be supported in mastering these. Anna Tardosh from the Pickler Institute, in her research article, The Researching Infant, says that around one year, infants become, um, infants will increase the, the number of play incidents that they have where they're handling two objects or toys. So it becomes very, very common. And what they do is it becomes more common for them to put in and take out. So the put in, take out, put in and take out. That's, they spend a lot of their time manipulating objects like that. But Anna say, says that this activity could be symbolic. For example, we're together, we're apart. We're together, we're apart. I found you, I lost you. I found you, I lost you. And children go over this, and so she feels that it has a symbolic quality to it. This is Bryce and Ellie. Young toddlers are often attracted to a toy, especially when another child has it. They take a risk, 
and they follow an impulse to take the toy, and then they have to modulate or control their behavior if they're not successful. So look at Ellie as she pursues Bryce with absolute intention, and he's quite a bit older than her. She's reaching, she's reaching, and look at him as he pivots. So you can tell this has happened to him before. He knows exactly how to turn his body. She touches him, so she almost tackles him, and he holds the object. And then look at her face in this. She goes for full body, and he moves. Look at her face there. What happened? What? I was so close. And look at the look that she gives him. And I go to Bryce, because I was right there, and I said, she wanted that toy. You didn't want her to have it, and you turned away. She really wanted it. He sort of harumphs at me, turns around. He's like, yeah, I know what happened. <laughs> and then I go to her and say, he took that. He wanted that, and he didn't let you have it. You really, really tried to get it. And she doesn't even give me a look. She walks right by and then pulls her little dress up, you know. She has a strong sense of self, and toddlers sometimes need to save face. So look at the way she just tugs up her tights and walks away. She's ready for the next confrontation. And Bryce also deserves our attention. Magda says that it's rare to have a child that always takes or a child that always loses toys. But how often do we say those things to ourselves when we're working with children and a conflict arises? Oh, not this again. Oh, God, he's always biting. She's always crying. And so we fall into that. But Bryce looks like he understands that he has just avoided losing that truck. And he may not be so lucky next time. But he can take care of himself. He's competent. What about the child that lets other toys be taken from him on a regular basis? What about a child that seems like they're always getting things taken? There's a concept in psychology called learned helplessness. And the idea is that we unconsciously learn to act with either a belief of power or a belief of helplessness. Chisla and colleagues wrote a paper called Early Predictors of Helpless Thoughts and Behaviors in Children. And what they did, and this was with five or six-year-olds, they did an experiment where they presented these children with puzzles. And some of them were easy, so the children could do them. And then some of them were a little bit more difficult to do, but they could do them. And then there were the ones that were impossible. They just weren't difficult. They were actually mismatched pieces. You really couldn't do them. And what they found was multiple reliable signs of what they called learned helplessness. And the signs for these are decreasing positive feelings, decreasing self-evaluation. So these children stopped thinking about what they were doing and trying to process to the next step. And a decrease in hopefulness and motivation. They also found an increase in negative feelings and an increase in protest or refusal. So as the, test, the tasks got harder, some children began to feel worse and try less and refuse and protest more through the process. This change from positive to negative feelings, from hope to giving up, was greater for some children than for others. Why was that? The researchers linked this change to two common factors. And after today, I know we all know what they were. It was problematic parenting and negative life events. And I want to just clarify what those things are and not use them loosely. For problematic parenting, they're talking about aversive feedback, which is really discouraging exploration and free play. Harsh punishment, so if a child, for example, like Ellie, who's chasing after someone to take something, then she would have been punished for doing that, and low levels of support. So we're really talking about extreme situations here. And the negative life events, similar to what Dr. Lieberman was talking about this morning, are things over which the child, he feels like he has no control. So it's a little bit different than the things that hopefully our children run into every day. But those things really have shown to be connected to this sort of um, learned helplessness. This is Quentin and Fiona. 
and they were in the same toddler class, apprehension or expectation of losing a possession can cause anxiety in a young toddler. Look at Quentin as he sees Fiona approaching. So he's sitting next to his mom. He sees her from across the room coming. Look at his face, slack jaw, just staring at her. He really can't do anything except for wait for her to come. He looks like he has some experience with this happening already. And as she holds and pulls his bowl, he's making split-second decisions about whether to hold on, whether to let go, or for how long to hold on to it before he lets go. Over here, he looks to me, the adult or the facilitator in his class, for support. And in the rye support, we may look at him, and I may have said, she wants that. She's really pulling it hard, and you're holding on very tight. And after losing the toy, the child has a variety of coping mechanisms, one of which is moving on to another item, which you see him do. She has it. He looks in another direction. He finds something else. Now she has it. And guess what? Now that she has it, it's not really very exciting to have it. Maybe it was the conflict that she wanted. And so she brings it back to him and offers it back. But Quentin is focused on this new toy. He's saving face. He's going to continue with his second choice. But sometimes as caregivers, we're emotionally upset when a child lets go too easily. We may notice that they're choosing another toy but we may see choosing as giving up. Maybe choosing another toy makes us think that they're choosing second best, that they're not asserting themselves. And we may pass judgments on that child's character and even worry about their future behavior. Will they always let people take things from them? Are they gonna be easy to manipulate that way? And this sometimes has more to do with our own upbringing than it does with the child's behavior. Research done by Arietta Slade shows that mothers who are better at understanding and talking about their own childhood behaviors and feelings are also better at understanding their own children's feelings and behavior, and especially when they need comfort and support. She calls this reflective functioning, and it's the mother's capacity to hold her baby and his mental states in mind. So it's the mother's capacity to see behavior and make inferences about what this might mean. Here's Quentin again with his mom. Young toddlers will react quickly to losing sight of a beloved adult. How quickly to react and to what degree are up to the caregiver. So you can see in this one, there's a divider in the room, so Quentin's mom has picked him up and put him over the divider, and then she just disappears. I don't remember whether she told him where she was going or not, but she basically put him over and then walked around. You can see Quentin goes to the divider. He actually started crying, and then she comes in the door and he looks to her. So she comes in, and you can see he's walking towards her with his little arms raised up, but guess what? She walks right by him. She wants to go sit down. And so he follows her with his arms, crying and whining. Ha, ha. And in passing, she puts her head, hand on his head and finds a seat. Quentin looks over to me again. I don't know why. And, uh, did you see what she just did? And um, she sits down, and then I think that he continues on to play. Oops. So Quentin's mom works outside the home. She has two other children. She's very, very busy, yet she makes time once a week to come to parent-infant class. What do you think about her just dropping him over and disappearing for a minute while she comes through the door? Would you have hoped that she would have said something to him or brought him in with her? She's usually very reflective. Again, I want to talk to you about the work of Arietta Slade. She says that even the most reflective mothers are not reflective all the time. Being out of sync, impatient, distracted, they're normal. And even normally sensitive and responsive caregivers can act that way. 
the parent-child relationship can be disrupted whenever there's strong or intense feelings, whenever there's something going on like conflict or something in the family. Because you're so close, emotions will run very high. But the caregiver, the reflective caregiver and the child, they can get back in sync. They can readjust the relationship even after times of stress. And this is, um, reminds me a little bit about Winnicott, who's a British researcher who talks about, and this was in the 60s, the good enough mother. It's not the perfect mother. It's just the good enough mother. She's good enough. She's not perfect all the time. An adult example of what was happening here would have been, for example, let's say you get in a fight with a friend or with your, your partner. If you have a fight and you don't have time to apologize at that moment, you can usually still do it later. And sometimes the relationship is even strengthened after you've gone back to repair the mismatch. So whenever there's a mismatch or a mistake, you can get back in sync, and that can even be positive for the relationship. This is Charlie and the triangle. Infants and toddlers often lose their balance. This can be frightening, but they'll still play and, dis and test despite the risks. Look at Charlie. He goes right up to it and flies over, and it's not a mistake. He wants this to happen because he would do it repeatedly. And then he would sort of thump down on the floor and then go back around and do it again. And his mother was sitting there right with him. He was fascinated by his own sensations of his body and the risk that he was undertaking. This looked very excited to another little boy in class whose name was Miles. And so Miles, you can see him approaching here, comes up and watches and then decides he wants to get up on the triangle right next to Charlie. He pushed him, he smacked him. His mother said, gentle, we touch gently. Charlie didn't want to, and so he t leaves, sucks his thumb, and goes and stands over there and turns his back to the whole situation. Charlie lost his space there, but he chose how to cope. How can toddlers keep coming back from war in situations like that? Gabor Mate, who is a Hungarian doctor working with addict addicts in Canada, wrote a book called In the Realm of the Hungry Ghosts. And he talks about how naturally occurring opiates in the brain play a part. They're part of the pleasurable reward system that bonds parents to babies and babies to parents. These natural brain substances don't take away pain, but they reduce our consciousness of it as pain being unpleasant. So maybe, he suggests, it's the high level of endorphins that toddlers have that help them endure the bumps and bruises that they get into. The pain isn't enough to discourage them from trying again and again. And he feels that without these high levels of endorphins, the toddler might even want to stop exploring his world. And this is Miles and Michelle. Toddlers can often lose their temper or control of their emotions. Showing empathy and supporting the child's experience are sometimes difficult for caregivers, especially when the conflict seems minor. Miles is crying and crying and crying for what he called the uck, which was the truck. So he goes to mom. He tried to get it. He failed. He goes to her, and he's pointing over and saying, uck, uck, uck crying, and mom gets close to him and says, you want that truck? He looks over, he's pointing to it again. And then she says to him here, you can see her looking up, she says, is there another truck you could choose? She doesn't say, go get that other truck, or you can just get another truck. She says, is there another one here you could play with? And you can see her looking up, and you can see him looking up. Oh, okay, I could look for something else. He finds one, and he's pointing to it. Over there! Goes to get it, finds another one, takes that one too for good measure, and brings them back to the safety of his mother's lap. Many mothers would have tried to distract him from the crying way back here. 
Ross Thompson in The Psychologist in the Baby says that when mothers give children words for their feelings during conflicts when they're two and a half years old, those children at age three have a higher sense of conscious, conscience. So they seem to be able to develop a conscience about things just by their mothers being talking to them more when they're in conflict situations like Michelle was doing. So the effects of stress in a situation like this is buffered or cushioned by supportive relationships. Miles was stressed and upset, but his mother was supportive and verbalized his feelings. And so the effects of this make it less stressful for the child. The National Scientific Council on the Developing Child, in a paper that they wrote called The Impact of Early Adversity on Brain Development, writes about positive stress and tolerable stress. They say that the relationships with adults that talk to you about how you feel helps you process stress, no matter how old you are. And this is the same kind of reflective talk or sports casting that Magda Gerber talked about. Again, from the, in the realm of the hungry ghosts, Matei writes that the mental activity critical to the development of emotional self-regulation has been called dispassionate self-observation. And this is the way that a person directs their attention will affect both the state of that person and his or her brain. So with her words, Michelle is giving Miles shape both to his emotional and to his cognitive experience, just with her words. And then in closing, this is Miles again, Michelle, same truck, different day. The toddler's conflicts will often escalate and several parties will be involved. It's hard to stay close and not try to correct the issue for them. And the issue is the trucks and Razel has a big stack of little manipulatives and he's very upset because he wants everything. At a recent workshop in Seattle, I heard Vanessa Kolhas talk about conflict in young children. She said, Valuable lessons are learned through these conflicts. How to respond to life's problems, express their own needs and desires, and recognize the expectations of others. Alicia Lieberman in Angels in the Nursery writes about how sometimes the parents don't see the child's signal or they don't understand what it's really about. So their quick reaction is more about how they feel about the conflict than how the child is feeling about it. And that becomes more important. So for example, here, if Michelle had been uncomfortable with this, her goal would have been to stop the conflict because it's more important for her that the conflict stops than it is that Miles is learning something from it. So it's more about her need for peace than it is for his need about whatever it is he's learning. And the care, but yet, it's the caregiver's emotional availability and empathic responsiveness that most helps infants and toddlers. These help them organize and cope with their feelings and inner experience. And it's sometimes hard to handle these situations the way we want. The good news is, again, we don't have to be perfect. Repairing mismatched communications may be as valuable as cre in creating the capacity for intimacy as an impeccable or perfect parent or caregiver that managed to handle this perfectly every time. The process of recognition and repair may continue through a lifetime. So it's not that important to be perfect, it's just important to really always be aware And so when I think about play, I propose that we include in our roles, first of all, setting up an environment that allows for joy and discovery, and secondly, offering our presence to the children in our care to scaffold their coping with loss. And in finishing, I'd like to read you a poem that um, one of my, my oldest daughter posted to her my spa my, uh, space page. <laughs> when she left um, after high school, and I always really like this. It's called One Art. The art of losing isn't hard to master. So many things seem filled with the intent that their loss is no disaster. 
lose something every day except the fluster of lost door keys, the hour badly spent, the art of losing isn't hard to master, then practice losing farther, losing faster, places and names and where it was you meant to travel, none of these will bring disaster. I lost my mother's watch, and look, my last or next to last of three loved houses went, the art of losing isn't hard to master. I lost two cities, lovely ones, and vaster, some realms I owned, two rivers, a continent, I miss them, but it wasn't a disaster. Even losing you, the joking voice, a gesture I love, I shan't have lied. It's evident the art of losing's not too hard to master, though it may look like a disaster. So I thank you for your attention this afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions about anything for me? What about the flathead syndrome mm -hmm. problem? It's a great question. A lot of parents now, um, and that's really why the tummy time is being recommended now as sort of a universal precaution. We're really treating it like a public health issue, and the tummy time is sort of an intervention. Um, when, if you actually look at the research, it's um, what research supports is free movement and a um, really being vigilant about the time that children spend in devices, especially nowadays. Children really will go from the hospital into the car seat and they'll stay in the bucket during the day and from there into a swing and from there maybe into some kind of boppy seat and then back into the car seat. So um, if we're gonna practice interventions, probably making sure that they have more free movement would be, I believe, another um, another positive option as opposed to the tummy time. I've looked at the research even about, it's the plagiocephaly, which is that's, um, and actually that has not, if you really look at the research there, that hasn't been linked to doing tummy time. That's not a cure for it. And um, just on an interesting note, the Pickler Institute in Hungary that's been open since 1946, they really don't have any um, incidences of flathead at all, and they, as part of what they do, is they put babies on their backs from, from really, from when they're born onwards on a firm surface. And if you think about it, since the the bones of the skull are not completely fused and knitted together, what could be better for really rounding out the head than being on a firm surface? And then, as you're looking from side to side and all around. Um, that has a positive effect, but as soon as you put a little something around their head so that their neck's too floppy and then you stretch them back like that, it's a whole other experience that the body is going through. There's great research out there. I encourage you strongly to look at it. It's really good stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, what I understand from Rai is that we shouldn't really um, intervene between two, two toddlers unless one of them is trying to hurt the other. But for my, my best friend's daughter, who's only a week older than mine, mm -hmm. she always tries to claw at her, and um, we're always intervening. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm wondering at what point we let my daughter sort of say no. I mean, I, they're only 11 months, but I... I I don't know. Yeah. Do you have a Is, are they doing the same kind of stuff that babies typically do to moms at that age, where they'll grab your hair really tight or they'll pull your mouth down? Is it that she kind of exploring? She tries to bite my daughter's head. Oh, and biting. She claws at her and uh -huh. scratches her, and um, mm -hmm. she she's very. My, my best friend says, "Single white female." I don't know what's wrong with her really? because yeah. she like she's always on top of her, but we're always. You know, yeah. either I or, or my friends always taking her off, and I wonder if we yeah. should maybe let her at some yeah. point do yeah. that. I don't There's, oh my gosh, I mean, I know with all of you guys sitting here in the front row that you could teach a two-day seminar about that. Um, so we won't go into that right now. I, I, let's try to focus on what you, what you can do rather than things that we shouldn't do. So some of the things that you could do, for example, when children are in conflict like that, is you can look at their motivation and also the environment and really think about what can I change. So for example, um, and what are they getting out of it? It sounds like she's exploring. So could I add some other things to that environment so she would have some other things to explore? Could I give her some options for it? You look like you like touching her face. Um, you can touch her face gently, or if you notice there's a lot of pulling, maybe you can have some other objects there. You can get close. 
Um, a lot of times it's, it's helpful if you just decide where you're gonna draw the line. So for example, you guys may not be bothered by this, but you might be bothered by this. So then maybe that's what you could say. I won't let you scratch her face. And when you see her touching gently, I, I like the way you're touching gently. It's, um, they really like to explore. And then part of it is also, I've just found, because it sounds like it's a conflict situation that's kind of repetitive, is just to go into it with a breath and a new attitude and not be like, oh, you always pull her mouth like that. But rather try to see it as a fresh exploring situation, because that's usually what those things feel like for children. It's very hard. I know it is. Stay close. <laughs> Anybody else? Uh huh. Last one. Okay. Thank you. Last uh, one. Okay. Um, talking about losing, um, mm -hmm. I have a boy who, when he loses his toys or his opportunity to play because he's th the time is over, he started. He got angry and he started to throw in toys, another toys, mm -hmm. and try to hit me, mm -hmm. so what is your best advice? Mm -hmm. it's, a great, it's a great question because I have noticed that in parent-infant classes, for example, I noticed that sometimes when we finished the class, there were some children that seemed to react so angrily or emotionally to that. And so what we tried to do is think about why are they acting that way, and then what can I do to change the environment to help that child? So some of the things that can help is to give them advance warning, especially if you know it's a situation that's painful for them. So um, I'll tell you a story. My, my youngest daughter was going in for some uh, vaccinations and those of you that practice ride, doctor's visits are always tricky because you know what they do, right? It's like arm one, arm two, and then they give them the shots simultaneously in multiple extremities. Like, what? And then they don't tell them, right? So I was doing my ride thing with Helena and I was like, we're going to go to the doctor and they're going to give you an injection. They're going to put a needle in your arm. You're going to feel it. It's going to hurt. And I've never seen anything like it. We, and she was a baby. We went in there, put her arm out. They did it. She cried for a minute, and it was over. And um, their capacity for understanding is so much greater, and we forget that sometimes. That um, it's just, just tell me what you're going to do. If it's, even if it's horrible, just tell me first, like Alicia Lieberman talked about. So at least I can prepare myself mentally for it. Because remember, what was her definition of um, that catastrophic stress? The first thing was something you're not prepared for. So by preparing the child, you're going a long way. Thank you, Alex. Uh, I see some people running out really quickly. I just want to thank all of our wonderful presenters today and thank all of you for spending your Saturday with us. You know, your presence here is sort of a testament, I think, to your, your commitment to learning and deepening your knowledge and all in the effort to strive to do really what is best for the babies and the children in your care. So kudos to you. I just want to let you know that the RIE membership meeting is going to start in a few minutes. We'll give ourselves a few minutes to get over there. In Haas 172, which is a room off the courtyard, everybody is invited. If you're curious about what we've been doing at RIE the last year and what our plans are for next year, you're welcome to come. And we'd really appreciate your filling out those conference evaluations that were, I believe, inserted in your program because it helps us a lot to plan for next year's conference. So thank you for spending today with us, and we hope to see you next year at number 23 back at the Skirbel on the 28th of April with Allison Gopnik. <laughs>